Okay, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in today. Um, Man, it's good to be recording a show. I have a massive podcast today. Maybe, possibly, I'm not sure. We'll find out after recording. This could be the longest podcast I've ever done. We have a Tom Brady film analysis. It's going to be massive. I'm very proud of the work I've done on that. We're going to talk about some NFL news. We'll do some more predictions versus reality. We'll end the show with Ask Zach Questions. And um, I actually want to start with a question from Patreon. Remember, you can go to, you can write into the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. You give a dollar a month. You can give more if you want to. Please do. It literally pays my rent. Um, And I do not guarantee to answer your question on the show, but I do guarantee I look at every single question with my eyeballs and I pick the top couple to read on the podcast. So Mercury writes in, he says, Zach, hope you and yours are doing well. Got a few quick ones for you. How have you been spending time during the shutdowns? Do you have any big or small plans for any more experimental type content with sports, the sports world largely on pause? What video games are you playing right now? I'm sure everyone could use some recommendations with more time to kill. Stay safe, man. Um, Mercury, (laughs) he or she, whoever they are, uh, thanks for writing in. I want to start here because I, I think it would be odd to start the show and not acknowledge What's going on in the world? So number one, um, I've been spending the majority of my time watching Tom Brady film. It's been fun. It's been daunting. It's been really hard. Um, You know, film analysis takes a long time. It is the most difficult and time-consuming thing I do. You know, watch all 16 games of an NFL season, take notes, figure out what's going on for this player, what's the story that I need to, that really what's the story that the, the film is telling me, trying to move my biases, do the best I can. Then you got to edit, you got to organize everything. And so I'll be frank, the majority of my time has been spent watching Tom Brady film and working on that topic. Um, it's been daunting, man. You know, it's this is not some random quarterback from Toledo State Northwestern. This is Tom Brady. And so I, I think I really felt a lot of pressure to do it right, to do it justice and make it really good and make sure I do my due diligence to get everything right because I don't, this is not, this is Tom Brady. This is a big deal. He's kind of, He's the greatest quarterback of all time, and I didn't want to screw it up. And so um, I've taken my time. I wanted to get it right. Um, you know, my goal has always been to make quality content, and I'm really grateful for the people who have really been patient and given me time to work on that and get it right. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that, you know, this it, it, is just true. Like, I'm not doing great. <laughs> I'm struggling. I live in Washington, which is where uh, the outbreak really first started in America. And I think... Um, quarantine depression is a real thing. Like I, I, I have to acknowledge that. Like I definitely have been less productive. It's really funny and ironic and kind of frustrating. Like everyone's stuck at home and you would think, dude, you work from home. Perfect. Easy. Just, just do your work every single day. But I, I'll be honest, like, you know, while my lifestyle really hasn't been that much affected, I don't leave my house really ever. Um, I work from home. I happily do that. Um, but it's the unknown that is really hard. And I, I've been working on this Tom Brady thing, and I have days where I sit and I look at the computer, and it's like, and I don't, it's not, I don't know. It's the unknown, I think. It's, it is scary to not know, like, uh, when are things going to go back to normal? Are we going to get an NFL season on time? Um, you know, I, I keep telling myself everything's going to be okay and we're going to be fine, um, but it is scary. Like, I, I have lost a day or two of work just because I, I think that I've been a little bit, I, I, I think this is relatable for the audience. Like, I think anybody listening to the show can relate to this. If you're in America, especially like, uh, when are we going to let get let out? When can we, <laughs> when can life go back to normal? My girlfriend lost her job. Um, I, I've, I felt kind of stuck, like kind of overcome by fear a little bit. And so I wanted to acknowledge that, you know, I've been working really hard, working my butt off on this Tom Brady video. Um, but definitely like things are going slow and I, I'm not doing the best I can. I, I see other people making content. And I'm like, man, good for you. I, I, <laughs> I don't know about you. I don't know about the people listening to the podcast. I felt really like an overwhelming, crippling at times, like anxiety or fear. Like, uh, are sports going to come back? Uh, can we go outside? Can we, are we, like, I, I don't know, but I'm genuinely afraid to get sick. And so 
Um, I know people out there might be feeling the same way. I want you to know that I, I, as someone who feels that way, I think it's okay to feel that way. Um, we're in kind of a weird historic time uh, that I think is something that we're always going to talk about. Like, kind of, you know, people from the generation just before, I was like four years old when 9-11 happened, but I know that my parents' generation all asked themselves, where were you during 9-11? And I, this feels very similar. Like we're going to ask ourselves, like, where were you? What was what were you doing during the global pandemic? So I encourage you pay attention. Uh, you're going to get asked questions about it forever. It's a historic time. And it's something I'm going to tell my grandkids about. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge, like, yeah, I've been working hard, but also there are times where I haven't been working. And, you know, I've been stressed. And, and when watching, hanging out with my girlfriend, again, she lost her job. It's been really tough. And um, it's just been interesting. Like, you know, what do I recommend to watch or play? I, I haven't done a lot of either. I, uh, my girlfriend has Smash Bros. That's been really fun. I mean, that's actually, <laughs> she beats me at Smash Bros, which is like dream come true. Really, really cool to have that. Um, but, you know, I did watch a couple episodes of this Netflix documentary called Dirty Money. It's great. Um, kind of discouraging because it's about how evil empires basically make money. It's kind of horrifying. Um, I'm really excited to watch a documentary. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. Um, called Senna about Ayrton Senna, the Formula One driver. Ozark is phenomenal. Ozark is a great show. Curb Your Enthusiasm is great. Um, but mostly, man, I've been working and I've been trying to not be horrified and have crippling anxiety. Like I, I know that's weird to say. I don't. I, I try to be open about who I am, and um, I think that the fear of the unknown. It's hard. I see people like Pat McAfee's done a show every single day. Like, dude, that's incredible. I'm, I'm so, I respect that. And part of why I haven't done a show in a while is because um, I, I have been legitimately working on the film analysis for Tom Brady, which is daunting and huge and takes forever. But also like, dude, I, I got to be honest. Like I am struggling. I, <laughs> I've definitely not worked as quickly as normal because I've just been, ah, and I think I have a, I figured it out. I got a plan now for the rest of the week and the rest of the month of, Okay, like we're going to be quarantined forever. Here's the content I'm going to make. But I had to change. I had a whole you know, list of stuff prepared for March Madness and the NBA season, then the draft, and it's all been destroyed. So I've had to kind of figure out what am I going to do next and what's my plan. And I have a plan now, um, but I will acknowledge, man, it's been crippling and hard. I've, I've already spent way too much time on this topic, um, but I wanted to just talk about it because I know that it just feels like it would be disingenuous to start talking and and not acknowledge the <laughs> the weirdness of the world right now, um, and, and that that is that. So it's time for the Tom Brady film analysis. I am very very proud of the work I've done on this video on this topic. Um, I want to say thank you to the people who have let me take my time. I think it really paid off. This is a high quality product. I am so so proud of this episode of Strong Opinion Sports. I hope if you do like it, please do me a favor. I, I never ever ever have asked for this. Like literally go back and listen to the very first podcast to now. I've never, ever asked, please like, and sh subscribe and share yada, yada. You know what to do. You know, to hit the subscribe button, you know, to like the video, if you're watching a video, whatever. Um, but I, I do hope this one time, if you like the video, please, uh, share it with your friends. I'm doing a standalone video where I will break out the Tom Brady film analysis segment. Uh, it's some of my best work I've ever done. I I'm so proud of it. And so I, I, I pre-recorded it. I wore the same shirt, but I intentionally like did that so it kind of better flow. But um, I'm going to cut to it now. But I encourage you, please, if you're out there, uh, do me a favor. Tell your friends and family about this video if you're at all interested in Tom Brady because I am so proud of the work I did. I worked incredibly hard on it. And uh, without further ado, enjoy the Tom Brady film analysis. Tom Brady has been in the NFL for 20 years. He's won six Super Bowls. We all know that over the course of his career, he's been an incredible quarterback. But the question is, how good is Tom Brady now? How good is he today in 2020? You know, people are concerned. What about his arm strength? Can he still throw a deep ball? His completion percentage is lower than normal. What's going on? Is he still a good quarterback? So I ask, what does the film say about Tom Brady? I believe this needs to be said first. Tom Brady's not a god. He's grown to have a kind of mythical status in the world of football. So to be clear, he's not perfect. He makes mistakes. When you watch him on film, you'll see he has bad throws. 
He'll throw an interception. He's human just like any other quarterback. He's got a pick six against Miami. I wonder, uh, did he not see the safety, Eric Rowe? Was he trying to check down to Sony Michelle and the ball got away from him? I don't know what he was thinking, but this is not a good play. So I want to repeat this. Tom Brady is not perfect. He makes mistakes just like any other quarterback. However, what is impressive is how rarely, how infrequently he screws up. It's not that Brady never throws an interception or never throws a bad pass. But when it does happen, it's an event. It's a big deal because it's rare. Now, I want to dispel a rumor about Tom Brady. There is a narrative that some people believe Brady can't throw a deep ball. It's simply not true. There are just too many examples on film of Brady throwing good deep balls. In general, his arm strength is underrated. He's not Patrick Mahomes, but who is? Brady can still drive the ball downfield on a line into tight windows. And that's what arm strength is. I believe there are two main reasons why people have developed the notion that Tom Brady can no longer throw the deep ball. Number one is the receivers he played with last year. And number two is his playing style. Let's start with number two. It makes sense to me why people would watch Brady and think he couldn't throw a deep ball. The reality is that If you casually watch Tom Brady, it's kind of boring. He gives the impression that he can't throw a deep ball, partly because he rarely does it, but the other reason is because Tom Brady is a thief. He's the master at stealing yards underneath. You know, growing up, my coach once told me, you can't go broke taking a profit. And Tom seems to have taken that to heart. He will literally throw a five-yard hitch Every single time if you let him, over and over again, five yards, four yards, three yards, five yards again, death by a thousand cuts. He doesn't care about stats or big plays. All he cares about is moving the ball downfield. He's very disciplined. He appears to have a deep philosophical rule. If you give him a three-yard completion, he will take it every single time. You even see plays where he appears to be wanting to throw the ball farther downfield, but suddenly a receiver will flash open underneath and he just takes it. He will never have a regret. You know, he'll never feel like, oh, I could have had a four yard completion, but I tried forcing a throw downfield instead. And his discipline pays off. As a result, his team is regularly in manageable third and short situations. So Tom Brady has a disciplined philosophy. Like a rule of thumb, if you give him a short five-yard completion, he will take it every time. But here's the key, though. When a defense takes away everything short underneath, quarterbacks need to be able to complete passes into tight windows downfield. And Brady can do that, too. Brady doesn't regularly throw underneath because he's limited. He does it because he's disciplined. That's Brady's style of play. But now I want to talk about the receivers he played with last year in 2019. Tom Brady never had a true outside threat at receiver last year. Now, I want to stop things because when I say this, people get confused and I've realized I need to define what that means. I've collected some prime examples of what a true outside receiver looks like and plays like. Julio Jones from the Atlanta Falcons is a great example of a true number one outside receiver. He can catch jump balls down the sideline, or he can throw him a back shoulder fade on the goal line. You want a guy who can beat one-on-one coverage downfield the way DeAndre Hopkins can fully extend to catch a deep ball, or Michael Thomas from the Saints making back shoulder grabs down the sideline. Another great example is Stephon Diggs beating his man in one-on-one coverage down the sideline. Or think of Keenan Allen from the Chargers, who's able to make tough grabs downfield. And at Tom Brady's next stop, he will be able to work with one of the best deep threats in the entire NFL, Mike Evans. A guy who can beat man coverage and make massive plays downfield. Last year, the Patriots did not have anyone like that. 
They didn't have a guy who could regularly beat man coverage down the sideline. Now, to the Patriots' credit, they tried repeatedly to get Brady a true outside threat. I will give them that. They brought in Antonio Brown. That didn't pan out. Josh Gordon didn't work out. They released him. They made a trade for Muhammad Sanu. And Sanu was a steady, reliable veteran receiver. But the reality was, number one, he was not a vertical threat. And number two, he came in midseason and was learning the offense on the fly. Now, the Patriots did draft a receiver, Nikhil Harry, in the first round of the NFL draft. But unfortunately, he got hurt and didn't play until week 11. By the final few games, he did make a little bit of progression. You know, he had a few big plays where he beat one-on-one coverage. However, he was not able to make enough progress with so few games to play in. And he made a number of rookie mistakes. In the end, Tom Brady and the Patriots did not have a true outside threat at receiver last season. They did not have a guy who could regularly line up outside against a corner and beat one-on-one coverage on the outside. And frankly, it crippled their offense. Now, when I say that there are people at home scoffing and fuming angrily, they're like, oh, you didn't mention Julian Edelman. Someone always says that. Someone always says, well, they had Julian Edelman. And yes, Edelman is a great receiver. He won a Super Bowl MVP award. But casual fans don't understand that Julian Edelman is not an outside receiver. He lines up inside at the slot position. So yes, Julian Edelman was the Patriots' best receiver last year. He was Tom Brady's go-to guy when they needed a play. And when the Patriots faced one-on-one coverage, he was their best bet. But again, Julian Edelman lines up inside. He does the majority of his work at the short and intermediate levels of the field. You know, these are 5 to 10 yard routes, usually in the middle of the field. He's a short, quick receiver. He's not a deep threat outside, downfield against one-on-one coverage. The Patriots did not have a true outside receiver last year. And that affected and hurt the way that Tom Brady is perceived by a lot of people. But you have to realize how tough it is to do your job without the proper tools. It's like a mechanic without a wrench or a computer programmer without a keyboard. You need that stuff to do your job properly. Like, of course, his numbers were down. He didn't have the tools he needed, but I want people to notice. He still found a way to succeed anyway. I mean, look, Brady was literally throwing deep balls down the sideline to his running back, James White. Throwing deep balls to Jacoby Myers and Philip Dorsett. The Patriots' young receivers really struggled at times, and it hurt Brady. Jacoby Myers and Nikhil Harry were both rookies. Jacoby Myers was an undrafted free agent. And Nikhil Harry came in so late back from an injury that you could see he was learning on the fly. You know, there's one moment where Brady expected him to go deep. You can tell from Brady's stance and body language. The corner was sitting at five yards, just waiting for a five-yard hitch. And Harry's supposed to convert the route and run right by him here. Instead, he stopped and waited next to the defender rather than making the proper adjustment. There's another moment, week 13, against the Texans where Tom Brady threw an interception because Nikhil Harry got beat inside on a slant. As a quarterback, you have one-on-one coverage with an outside receiver running a slant. You have to throw the ball before or right as your receiver breaks inside. Quarterbacks have to trust that their receiver is going to win inside with the corner jockeying for positioning. On this play, Nikhil Harry got pushed around. He was beat inside, making Brady look bad. You know, there's an example on a similar play where veteran receiver Mohamed Sanu does the right thing. Mohamed Sanu is jockeying for positioning with the defender, trying to fight inside on a slant. And Sanu won inside with body positioning and caught the ball. Now, Philip Dorsett was the worst Patriots receiver. He is one of the most infuriating players I have ever watched on film. My list goes number one, Mitchell Trubisky, number two, Blake Bortles, and then Philip Dorsett. He's a former first-round pick and a total bust. He played with Andrew Luck and Tom Brady, and he still hasn't been able to figure it out in the NFL. 
He's been in the NFL for five years, and he's already now on his third team. And he did not fit with Tom Brady at all. Brady relies heavily on timing and guys being in the right spot at the right time. The smallest imperfection can cause a disaster. So the Patriots offense relied on precision and attention to detail. And Philip Dorsett was awful at those things. So not only was he a guy who could not beat one-on-one coverage at all, he was also regularly in the wrong place or doing the wrong thing. You know, there's one example where Brady gives him a hand signal to go deep. And uh, Philip Dorsett doesn't see it at all. He cuts his route short and runs a hitch instead. Brady throws the ball deep and his receiver isn't there. Or there's another example against the Chiefs where the defense brings an all-out blitz, which means that Brady needs to get rid of the ball immediately to beat man coverage. And Philip Dorsett, who's a special kind of oblivious, doesn't even expect the ball to come in his direction. There's a reason the Patriots did not invite him back to their team. Philip Dorsett's really fast, but that's about it. The guy could not make contested catches against one-on-one coverage. He regularly ran the wrong routes. He missed signals. You know, people were wondering why Tom Brady had a lower completion percentage than normal. Like, oh, why is Tom Brady's completion percentage so low? Uh, Well, number one, his receivers did not help him very much. Number two, though, is that Brady threw the ball away a ton. Defenses need to understand that the way to get Tom Brady to throw in completions is to get pressure on him. But here's the kicker. You can't do it by constantly blitzing him. There are 11 players on defense, and usually four or five of them are rushing the quarterback, depending on the offensive formation. Now, if you take players out of coverage and send extra defenders after the quarterback, which is what a blitz is, then you play right into Brady's hands and you help him out. Week one, the Steelers sent a blitz after Brady, and he just calmly found the weakness in the defense and threw a touchdown. There's a play against the Chiefs where the guy who was supposed to guard Julian Edelman blitzed. All Edelman did when the ball was snapped was simply turn around and catch the ball. It's a veteran move. Blitzing Tom Brady is a fool's errand. All it means is you will have fewer people in coverage and he's going to have an even easier time beating you. But if your defensive line can win one-on-one matchups, then you can hurry him and force him to get rid of the ball early. Now, unfortunately for Brady, his offensive line was regularly beaten. And then it becomes a game of math. You know, there was a situation against the Cleveland Browns where the Patriots used seven guys to block six Browns defenders rushing the quarterback. And the Browns still won up front. So again, the way to slow Brady down is to get pressure with your defensive line. If you can both drop a ton of guys into coverage and still create pressure, then you will succeed. There was a sequence during week one where the Steelers were able to get pressure on him three plays in a row with only a four and five man rush, meaning they would drop six or seven guys into coverage and still were able to generate pressure. They disrupted the entire Patriots offense that way. Now, one major interesting part of Tom Brady's game is that he refuses to take a sack. He doesn't want to lose yardage and will not take a negative play. So he will throw the ball away to avoid a sack. In fact, Brady does this so often, I had to come up with a new term and annotation. It's called a throwaway from the pocket. T-A-F-T-P in my notes. Normally, throwing the ball away happens outside the pocket. There's this arbitrary area called the pocket, similar to the tackle box. It's an area roughly from the right tackle to the left tackle. And when a quarterback is outside of the pocket extending the play, you can, quote, throw the ball away or throw the ball out of bounds if, say, you're trying to avoid pressure or if no one's open. Now, a key factor here, though, is you also have to throw the ball beyond the line of scrimmage if you're going to legally throw it away. Now, when you're in the pocket... You cannot throw the ball away or out of bounds to simply avoid a sack. That's called intentional grounding. Intentional grounding is a rule that exists to give the defensive line a fair chance. That way, quarterbacks can't just fling the ball away anytime there's pressure on them. But of course, 
Tom Brady has found a loophole in that rule. He realized that as long as you throw the ball near a receiver, the rest can't call it intentional grounding. Brady can just claim that he threw a bad pass. Whoops. <laughs> and let me tell you, Brady abuses this shamelessly. It's really annoying for defenses. But it's also really smart because it makes him nearly impossible to sack. It does happen from time to time, but it's rare. Brady hates taking sacks because he understands and knows that losing yardage will kill a drive. So when he's about to get sacked, he will throw the ball in the dirt in the direction of the nearest receiver. And as long as he throws the ball to an area where there's a receiver, then it becomes a legal throw away from the pocket. It's literally evil genius type of stuff. The dude found a loophole. There's even one incredibly egregious example against the Chiefs where Brady is dead to rights, but then he just slams the ball into the ground. Initially, a flag was thrown, but Brady pointed out that technically, number 83, a receiver, was in the area. And amazingly, the flag was picked up. Not a penalty for intentional grounding. Brady just mercilessly abuses this loophole he found. But hey, it is a really smart way to avoid sacks. It would even be really tough to get out of the rule book because how do you police it? How do you judge what's a mistake versus an intentionally bad pass? And honestly, with quarterback safety at an all-time high importance, the league might not actually want to get rid of the loophole. Now, I did find one moment week four against the Buffalo Bills where Brady threw the ball to an area where there was no receiver, and oh, he was flagged for intentional grounding. I found one example, but man, is it a rare, rare sight to see Tom Brady flagged for intentional grounding. So remember, T-A-F-T-P, throw away from the pocket. It's a new thing that Tom Brady basically invented. And it's funny to me, man, people are concerned about Tom Brady's accuracy. You know, there's a throw against the Bills that, to the untrained eye, looks like a terrible throw. But here's the reality behind it. Early on in the year, Brady showed a tendency to throw to the single receiver side. He loved taking advantage of one-on-one -on -one coverage on the backside of a play. It's something he regularly did throughout the year. Isolate a receiver, get him in a one-on-one -on -one match if he could win, and Brady would exploit it. The Bills know Brady loves to throw to the single receiver on the backside, and they're expecting it. Right as Brady turns to throw, he sees a defender sitting and waiting for the ball. He only had one option to throw to on this play, and it's not open, so he throws the ball away, high over everyone's head. It's a smart play. It looks like a terrible and accurate throw, but it's actually Brady living to see another down, avoiding an interception and avoiding a negative play. So why was Tom Brady's completion percentage lower last year? Number one, he had crappy receivers who either dropped passes, couldn't beat one-on-one -on -one coverage, or simply ran the wrong routes. And number two, Brady had a struggling offensive line that caused him to throw the ball away a ton. Everyone looks at that number completion percentage and thinks, man, Brady must suddenly not be as good. But the reality is that last year, the team around him wasn't as good. Last year, the Patriots struggled with basic things on offense. They struggled with pass blocking assignments and running even the right routes. Now, I got to say, though, I really enjoyed watching Brady on film. There's a couple things I enjoyed I want to share. Uh, number one, the dude is so well prepared. He always knows exactly where his checkdowns are and always has a pre-snap plan. There's a play against the Eagles where the Eagles defense played man coverage and they just made things so easy for Brady. He simply picked his best matchup pre-snap and threw an easy first down to Julian Edelman. When young quarterbacks watch Brady, I want them to pay attention to his feet. As the years have gone on, he's evolved and now always has a calm pitter-patter with his feet, resetting his feet to each target in the pocket. And he has tremendous rhythm and timing. And by the way, the dude can still move way better than anybody gives him credit for. Yeah, look, Brady's incredibly slow. I can't imagine a race he'd be able to win. 
but he also moves really well within the pocket. He can slide around and keep a play alive when he needs to. He's also the best quarterback I've ever seen at QB sneaks. If a defender leaves a gap open up front in a short yardage situation, then he will happily exploit it to steal a first down. And that's what I respect about Tom Brady. The dude is scrappy and disciplined. He's slow. He doesn't have a cannon for an arm like Patrick Mahomes. But he does all the little things it takes to succeed. He's constantly finding ways to make defenses wrong. Brady's fun to watch because his success is all because of attention to detail and preparation. You know, how can I steal a first down? Or how can I get this four-yard completion? What can I do to give my team an edge so I can win? When I watch LeBron James dunk or Patrick Mahomes throw a 70-yard pass from his knees, I feel helpless because that's impossible to replicate. Brady feels uniquely attainable because it's not someone doing something superhuman. He's a smart guy who puts a ton of time and preparation into his craft. I respect Brady's approach. And the truth is, the guy hasn't fallen off a cliff. He succeeded last year in spite of his receivers, in spite of a bad offensive line. He can still throw the deep ball, and physically, he's better than people realize. The film says Tom Brady still got it. Uh, People can say whatever they want. They can list whatever stats or numbers they want to, but the truth is that when it comes to Tom Brady's, quote, decline, many people are very, very wrong. But how did we get here? Look, I know I'm the only person saying this stuff, but I think the sad reality is that most people don't do the work. They're very surface level when it comes to their analysis. I did hours and hours of watching film to get to this point. Most people just look at a spreadsheet. They go, well, uh, the completion percentage is not as good as it used to be. And the reality is that's too surface level. That's not enough work to figure out what a quarterback is all about and really how good they are. And uh, the film simply disagrees with the majority of people out there talking about Tom Brady. And that's sad, but that's the state we've gotten to as a sports world. People don't want to do the work to watch games or watch the film. They want to look at a spreadsheet and go, this equals this, therefore that is bad. And that's not good enough. That's too surface level. And that's why the narrative exists that Tom Brady is, quote, declining and not as good. Uh, The film disagrees with most people's opinion and most people's quote, you know, analysis, because most people's analysis is far too surface level. Uh, You know, I want to talk about Philip Dorsett. I just did a film analysis about Tom Brady. Philip Dorsett was a Patriots receiver, which means that I've watched a ton of film of Philip Dorsett, and I hated watching him. Uh, He's one of the three players I have found most infuriating to watch on film in all of my time watching film. Number one is Mitchell Trubisky. Number two is Blake Bortles. And number three is the receiver, Philip Dorsett. The guy ran the wrong routes. He showed a complete lack of self-awareness. He dropped balls. He couldn't beat one-on-one coverage or make contested catches. He was a mess. Philip Dorsett was a nightmare as a member of the Patriots. But he did just sign a one-year, $1 million deal with the Seattle Seahawks. A very small deal, very low risk for Seattle. And I actually believe Seattle could be a perfect fit for Philip Dorsett. He's a former first round pick. And after five years in the NFL, he's been now, he's now on his third NFL team. And his quarterbacks, he's played with Andrew Luck and Tom Brady. I mean, Philip Dorsett has been unable to make it work with some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. He's a bust. He's a complete bust. He's a first-round bust in the NFL. However, Philip Dorsett might be able to find redemption in Seattle. I am so excited to find out what happens. Uh, He was a horrible, horrible fit in New England. The Patriots' offense is incredibly detail-oriented. Everything relied on everybody running the right route, being in the right spot all the time. There's very little improvisation And it's very complicated. It relies on you or a guy being in exactly the right place at exactly the right time. It's very precise. Philip Dorsett is not suited for an offense like that. The dude kept running the wrong routes. He showed a complete lack of understanding of the Patriots playbook. 
Now, not only will Philip Dorsett work really well with Russell Wilson, a guy who likes to scramble, he likes to improvise often, the playbook gets completely thrown out, he runs around, does his own thing. But it's not, that's not the only reason why Philip Dorsett might work really, really well in Seattle. Remember, Seattle drafted a wide receiver, DK Metcalf, last year in the NFL draft. And I, I think that shows a, a really good example of how Seattle could bring in Philip Dorsett and find a great way to use him. Remember, DK Metcalf, when he was drafted, was not really ready from a technical standpoint to be a high-level NFL receiver. Yes, he was incredibly physically gifted, but DK lacked polish. He lacked the ability to run routes in an elaborate offense. He really wasn't a highly skilled technical route runner. So here's what the Seattle Seahawks did. They drafted DK Metcalf. This guy who uh, I acknowledge is a freak of nature when it comes to physical ability. He can jump up. He can run really fast. He's very strong. And the Seattle Seahawks said, here's what we're going to do. All we're going to ask you to do is what you're good at. We're going to keep it really simple. We're not going to put too much on his plate. And for the majority of the year, all DK Metcalf did was run slants, fades, and hitches. Very, very simple concepts. And then slowly over the course of the year, they added more onto the plate of DK Metcalf. And it was a massive, massive success in Seattle. If they can follow that same formula with DK Metcalf on Philip Dorsett, it could work really, really well. I believe the Seahawks could do the same thing, and it could be phenomenal. You know, Philip Dorsett has some talent. His best asset is his speed. He's incredibly fast. And I think the Seattle Seahawks could bring him in, figure out what he's best at, and then only ask him to do that. What are you good at? What routes do you like to run? What things can you remember? Let's use your speed effectively. I would not be surprised if Philip Dorsett found a way to succeed in Seattle. Look, I don't expect him to succeed. He's failed everywhere he's been pretty badly. His performance in New England was frustrating and awful to watch. Philip Dorsett was a pain in the... It's so frustrating. Like, dude, get it together. You could be open if only you ran the right route. You could be this. You could be that. There were so many if onlys with Philip Dorsett on film in New England. He didn't ever make it happen. However, I do want to acknowledge the fact that if Seattle can bring him in and ask very little of him, only let him do what he's good at, then perhaps Philip Dorsett could find not only redemption, but find success finally in the NFL with the Seattle Seahawks. He's a good fit with Russell Wilson, who loves to improvise. Often the playbook doesn't even matter. The Seattle Seahawks offense is far less technical and far le- it's, it's still a detail-oriented offense. Every NFL offense is. But compared to New England, Seattle is a breeze. It's going to have a much better time. And then maybe Seattle has the, the vision, the understanding, hey, Philip Dorsett can't be treated like a normal receiver. If we put very little on his plate and only ask him to do the things he's good at, they might succeed. Because New England wasn't going to do that, but maybe Seattle will. And maybe, just maybe. Philip Dorsett will, in fact, succeed in the NFL. I cannot... Philip Dorsett's, again, incredibly frustrating. I cannot think of a single team, however, that he could go to that would be a better fit than the Seattle Seahawks. If there is one NFL team in the league where Philip Dorsett could find a way to succeed on, it is, in fact, the Seattle Seahawks. We will find out what happens, and I'm excited to see what happens. I hope he succeeds. I'm not saying I love the guy. Had a frustrating time watching him, but I really hope that Philip Dorsett can find a way to make it work in Seattle. Okay, uh, let's talk about the Bears. I feel like I'm so far away from my mic. Things are weird. Um, The Chicago Bears head coach, Matt Nagy, and their general manager, Ryan Pace, came out and said that quarterbacks Nick Foles and Mitchell Trubisky will have an open competition for the starting quarterback job this fall. And this is massive massive, massive news if you're a Bears fan in Chicago. Um, Because unless Mitchell Trubisky suddenly gets way, way better, immediately Nick Foles is now the starting quarterback in Chicago. Nick Foles is a way better quarterback than Mitchell Trubisky. Uh, Now, there is a very, 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 very small percentage of a chance that the competition brings out the very best and Mitchell Trubisky, and suddenly Trubisky is a different quarterback. He's way better than we've ever seen before. 
but I wouldn't bet on it. I just, I don't see that happening. Uh, I believe very strongly Nick Foles is going to be the starting quarterback in Chicago. And I am, oh man, I'm so happy. Mitchell Trubisky has pulled down the Bears organization now for years. He's been a mess. He's been awful. He's never become the quarterback the Bears needed him to. He misses easy throws. He really struggles with decision making. He just is a, a mess as a quarterback. In fact, last year, Mitchell Trubisky should have been benched for backup quarterback Chase Daniel. The only reason why they didn't is, well, he's a high draft pick. We can't really uh, get away with draft, you know, benching our, quote, high draft pick franchise quarterback for Chase Daniel. Last year, the reason why Trubisky stayed the Bears quarterback was because of politics, not because of talent. However, Nick Foles, oh, big name. People love him, and he's a competent quarterback. And I think finally, finally, the Bears have gotten so frustrated with dealing with Mitchell Trubisky, they're like, screw it. We are ready to move on if we have to. And Foles, again, he's a competent quarterback. He can read a defense. He can complete the easy, simple throws that, for whatever reason, Mitchell Trubisky really, really struggles to make regularly. And when I heard the thought, when I heard the announcement that the Bears were opening up the quarterback position for a competition, I just went, finally, finally, the Bears have recognized they're solving their Mitchell Trubisky problem. I'm so happy for Bears fans. They've been liberated and saved from the terror that is Mitchell Trubisky, their former quarterback. Uh, Again, there's a very, very small percent chance that Trubisky suddenly gets way better and the competition makes him better. I would not bet on it. If I was a betting man, I would put all my money on Nick Foles becoming the Bears' eventual starting quarterback, probably even week one. And as a person who has been frustrated for years watching Mitchell Trubisky, oh, I'm so happy. I am so happy for Bears fans. They've been liberated. And again, the Bears' Mitchell Trubisky problem has been solved. Uh, the Chiefs, the Kansas City Chiefs have restructured wide receiver Sammy Watkins' contract. Um, he went from a base $13.7 million base salary to now a $7 million base salary. A big pay cut. Honestly, he's got a more incentive-based contract. He can earn more money if he does enough stuff and meets all the incentives that is listed in his contract. But he just went from $21 million against the salary cap to now just over $15 million against the salary cap. And given that the NFL salary cap is estimated to be $198,200,000, that means Sammy Watkins went from being 10.5% of the Chiefs' salary cap to now just over 8% of their salary cap. Here is why all of this is interesting to me. Number one, it's really cool. Sammy Watkins was willing to take a pay cut to stay in Kansas City. The truth is that the Chiefs didn't have room for him in their salary cap, and they would have had to move him because he would have cost too much. And so he made the choice, I want to stay in Kansas City. I'll take less money to do it because he wants to be there in that city on that football team. And I think this is so cool. He gets it. Sammy Watkins could have been traded and made a little bit more money somewhere else on a crappy team. He took less money. The truth is, have fun, win games, and play with Patrick Mahomes, the best quarterback in the NFL. Here's what Sammy Watkins realized. This is a smart move for my quality of life. Again, he could go to a bad team that needs a receiver with a crappy quarterback, not have as good a year, not have as many balls thrown his way, or he could stay in Kansas City win a lot of games, have fun, play with Patrick Mahomes. And I think it's awesome, man. I I am so, I'm happy for Sammy Watkins. He's getting a good deal out of this. Maybe not financially, but quality of life is going to be so much better on a team that's going to win games and has a great quarterback throwing him the ball. Remember, a receiver is dependent on the quarterback. If you don't play with a great quarterback as a receiver, oh boy, is it frustrating. But here's the other thing that's really, really interesting about this story, the Kansas City Chiefs have really kept their team together. They haven't really lost anybody. It's crazy. You know, the Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. And in fact, I think they've gotten better as a roster, which is scary and terrifying to think about. You know, they might be better next year and they're going to have Sammy Watkins back. I'm happy for Sammy Watkins. 
he took initiative here. He made a move to keep himself in the city and playing for the Kansas City Chiefs. And I'm so happy for the Chiefs. It's scary that they kept their team together. And people are taking pay cuts to stay with Patrick Mahomes and stay in Kansas City. And uh, the Chiefs are a Super Bowl contender again next year. And the thought is just, uh, again, a scary one. They're going to be a really good team next year. And people have taken pay cuts to keep the team together. Okay, uh, another news. The 49ers have turned down multiple trade offers for backup quarterback Nick Mullins. This is not a surprise to me at all. Um, It's not a surprise, number one, that teams wanted to trade for him. And it's also not a surprise that the 49ers were unwilling to make the trade. Probably for my guess is like a fourth round draft pick for Nick Mullins is what was offered. Something like that. And I remember that, please, I ask you to remember that when Jimmy Garoppolo got hurt, he tore his ACL during the 2018 season. Nick Mullins is the guy who came off the bench and filled in. He had his first debut start against uh, the, at the time, the Oakland Raiders. He was phenomenal. I believe it was Monday Night Football. And Nick Mullins has limited arm strength. But he's a great, fantastic decision maker. He runs offenses really, really well. He makes great decisions. And, uh, you know, because of his physical limitations, he won't ever be a long-term answer at quarterback or become a franchise quarterback for anybody. However, he is an ideal backup quarterback because he's a guy who can come in and make great decisions and keep your offense steady when your starter is hurt. A couple guys are like this in the NFL, guys who are... They're never going to be franchise quarterbacks, but they offer short-term stability in a situation where they, where they need to come in for you know three games, four games, maybe five games. There are a couple of guys like this. I, I, some of the best backups in the NFL are you know, Nick Mullins in San Francisco, Case Keenum in, uh, the Cle- in Cleveland with the Cleveland Browns, and then Kyle Allen is with the Washington Redskins. These are guys who are not long-term answers at quarterback, but they are great temporary fixes, kind of like duct tape at the quarterback position. You can put them on. They're not going to last very long, but they're good enough for a little bit to hold things together while you can get a real long-term solution in at quarterback. Uh, Nick Mullins is a good backup. He was kept in San Francisco for a reason, and it does not surprise me at all. They were not willing to part ways with their quarterback and backup quarterback, Nick Mullins. He's one of the best in the business. Okay, uh, everybody's stuck at home. Colleges are closed. And uh, the fear, and really the, the, the reality here, is that colleges might remain closed this fall. And that would mean that the college football season couldn't happen. You know, the NFL can play games in empty stadiums. That's a real ability, you know, possibility here. But colleges are different. The athletes in college football are not professionals. And uh, they need to be in school. They need to have campuses open for them to attend college. And look, you can have every school, like you can have eight schools out of 10 in the Pac-12 agree to open up their doors. But if even just one, let's say every school, but Oregon State or every school except for Stanford decides to open up their campus. If one school in the conference doesn't open up, it ruins things for everybody. And, you know, if campuses are closed, then college football cannot happen, may not happen, and it will not happen. So one idea currently being thrown around is that maybe the NCAA is going to move the college football season from this fall and push it back to January. It would take place from, you know, between January and May. It would start in January, end roughly in May. But here's what's crazy. The NFL draft is in April. So I want you to imagine that Trevor Lawrence playing for Clemson is in the middle of his season and then suddenly gets drafted with the number one overall pick in April. Does he keep playing for Clemson? What does he do? And honestly, the reality is that if the college football season gets moved to January, then some of the top players, guys like Trevor Lawrence, simply are not going to play. You know, he's the quarterback at Clemson. He's not, Trevor Lawrence is not going to play. He needs to be at the combine doing interviews with teams face-to-face, getting to know them, talking to teams in February. He gets drafted in April. He's not going to risk an injury. And here's what's even weirder. You know, here's a, the college football season. If it goes back to January or May, what, when are they going to come back? 
Are they going to have games in January through May, then have June and July off, then football training camp starts again in August for the next fall season? If you push things back, everything has to get pushed back forever. Like, you can't have, you're going to have two college football seasons next year in 2021, one in the spring and then one in the fall. You have to realize the, the damages and the, I guess, repercussions of having you know, a pushed back college football season. It's bizarre, man. Here's what's even more interesting. Colleges cannot cancel college football. They need the money. Colleges need the money that college football generates. And so they actually cannot afford to cancel the season. There's a crazy problem here. Like, how is this going to – you can't cancel college football. Everybody needs the money. But also you can't have it because campuses might be closed. And if you move it back, you screw up everything in any way. It's really crazy. What's going to happen? I, I don't know. I think what is likely going to happen is if they do move things back to January, you're going to have a weird skin, uh, skull and bones, very, I guess the word is bare bones, college football season with a lot of talent sitting out, a lot of guys not playing. Think about this. What would this mean for the XFL? I mean, number one, ratings next fall for next, I guess, next spring for the XFL. If college football gets moved back to January, ratings for the XFL would be screwed. I mean, think about it. Viewership would be deciding between an XFL franchise, a team they're not very familiar with, which is new and and an upstart league, or are they going to watch their local college team, a a team they've been invested in for years? If you're an Alabama fan, you have, let's say, uh, what about this? Uh, You know, in uh, Missouri, you have the St. Louis Battlehawks in Kansas City. I I guess in in St. Louis. Wow, St. Louis. What am I talking about? You have the St. Louis Battlehawks in St. Louis, or you have... The Mizzou football team. What are you going to watch? You went to Mizzou, you're a longtime fan, or this new thing, the St. Louis Battlehawks, you barely know, and they only played one year last year, only played five games. So viewership would go to college football, but here's another fun thing to think about. XFL versus college football. Imagine you're a college football player, and you have one season left. And you're a fringe NFL guy. You're not tre- like like Trevor Lawrence doesn't need to play. He's already going to be the number one overall pick. In fact, playing probably would hurt his stock in the NFL. So the guys at the very very top of the NFL draft don't need to play. But if you're a guy who's like a seventh round pick, a projected seventh round pick, you really do got to play somewhere because you have to increase your draft stock and try to prove how good you are and prove that NFL teams need to draft you higher than the seventh round or have you be an undrafted free agent. But here's the question. You have one year left in, the, in college football. At least you have one year left before you go to the NFL. Where do you want to play? Do you play in college or do you play in the NFL? Excuse me, what am I saying? Do you play in college or do you play in the XFL? Professional football or college football? Yeah, again, you got spring football, and then you're headed off to the NFL. Where do you play? I hope I'm not confusing people. You could go to the XFL, which has a shorter season, fewer games to get injured in. And, oh, bonus, ding, 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 you get paid. Oh, you get paid to play football. If you play college football, it's ha- was happening at the exact same time. In college football, you'd have a longer season, more games, higher chance to get injured. You're not making any money. And, in fact... You're not making money. You have to pay. You don't have to pay, but you have to go to classes. You have to go to biology, math, science. You have to take classes, which you don't want to take. You want to play college football. So because they're happening at the same time, potentially next year, the XFL and college football, if you put them side by side, the XFL is a much better deal for players. It's just that's what you want to do. It's just It's a very interesting year because... The talent might leave college football next year. Now, new guys would emerge, probably freshmen. But it would still be a very, very odd year. College football might be kind of you know, gutted of all its talented players if, if college football, the season gets moved back to January. It's going to be a crazy ripple effect. How does it affect the draft? Who's going to play? What about the XFL versus college football? Are you really going to have a, a season in spring? And then again next fall, is it going to become a spring sport? What's going to happen to college football if you move everything back the way it's going? A lot of odd stuff going on, and I'm really fascinated to see what happens and how college football handles the possibility of not being able to have a season this fall. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. I'm going to take a short break. 
Whew, we got a lot of stuff coming up. When I return, we're going to do predictions versus reality. And then at the end of the show, we're going to do Ask Zach and answer some questions from the audience. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. I'm going to take a short break, rest my voice. When I return, uh, we'll do a lot of fun stuff. My name is Zach Schaumler. I will be right back. All right, we are back. Um, I predicted the New England Patriots to go 12-4 and four last year. I called them scary good. And uh, I was really excited about the receiving core. You know, Josh Gordon, Nikhil Harry, they had this undrafted rookie free agent. Jacoby Myers, the guy I was excited about. And, you know, I, I even wondered if their tight end, Rob Gronkowski, was going to come back maybe midseason. And I said the Patriots were a Super Bowl contender with a scary, scary defense. Well, uh, here's the reality of what happened last year with the New England Patriots. They did, in fact, go 12-4. and I got that part right. And they did have a great defense. But the reality is that their receiving core was highly disappointing. I watched their entire season and did a gigantic film analysis of Tom Brady. And uh, Josh Gordon was traded midseason. Then he got suspended for violating the NFL substance policies. They tried to bring in uh, Antonio Brown. Didn't work. Failed miserably. They traded for Muhammad Sanu. He was fine, but not really the true outside receiving threat they needed. They did draft, oh, Nikhil Harry in the first round of the NFL draft. He got hurt. Didn't play till week 11. And even when he did come back, he was really never able to come back and, you know, reach full speed. Uh, He still struggled with understanding the playbook. He had a couple big plays. He didn't capitalize on a couple other stuff. Nikhil Harry never really became what the Patriots needed him to be at the end of the year. And uh, Jacoby Myers, that undrafted free agent out of, uh, out of North Carolina State, was a good contributor. He was solid, not bad, uh, especially because he was an undrafted free agent. That's a big deal. Like, wow, solid contributor from a guy like that who had such low expectations uh, from an NFL perspective. That's great, but the reality is the Patriots needed more than a guy who was solid. And, you know, Philip Dorsett, the receiver, was highly, highly disappointing. And he's one of the worst receivers I've ever seen on film. He was a mess, ran the wrong routes, couldn't make contested catches, screwed up constantly. And worst of all, the Patriots' offensive line was not good. All that stuff caused Tom Brady, their quarterback, to have a lower-end statistical year. Even though I think Tom Brady played great, the reality is that the Patriots didn't have the playmakers and the tools they needed to help Tom Brady, their quarterback. Uh, Tom Brady was under constant pressure. He regularly had to throw the ball away early. And, you know, I watched the film. It was ugly. And so the reality of what happened is the Patriots lost in the first round of the playoffs. They won their division. Great. I mean, they did beat the Buffalo Bills, which was, they beat them twice last year. Very close wins both times, which is, hey, that's, that's not bad. The Bills are an up-and-coming team. They also made the playoffs. But, uh, you know, the reality of my 2019 Patriots prediction is they just weren't as good as I thought they would be. They were solid. They were they did go 12-4 and four like I predicted, but they didn't make a run at the end of the year like I would have predicted. And the biggest reason was they just could not find a way to come up with a playmaking receiver on the outside. They had Julian Edelman. Julian Edelman is not an outside receiver. He lines up inside. He doesn't consistently run deep balls and verticals and beat man covers on the outside down along the sideline. And that was a gigantic limiting factor for the Patriots last year. And it cost them down the stretch in the end of the year. How about the Buffalo Bills? I predicted the Buffalo Bills to go 6-10 in 2019. And uh, oh boy, I was wrong. And it's never have I been so happy to have been wrong about a team. I really enjoyed watching the Buffalo Bills. In fact, it's funny. Uh, I predicted them to go 6-10. and 10, And... Their record was actually the complete inverse of what I predicted. They went 10 and 6. You know, 6 and 10 was prediction. Reality was 10 and 6. And if you go watch my video called The Bills Will Go 6 and 10 in 2019, it's titled that. I started the video with this long rant about all the great offseason moves that the Bills had made. They added a ton of quality starters, and I was impressed with the value that they added. And it paid off. The Bills were a good team and, in fact, a playoff team. They were great. But here's where I really, really missed with the Buffalo Bills. I miscalculated how much progress their young quarterback, Josh Allen, was going to make. I was hesitant about him. I, you know, I was not sure how good he would be. 
and he got a lot better last year. His rookie year was solid. You know, he kind of reminded me, he played very um, inconsistent as a rookie, made a lot of mistakes, made some throws. I was like, eh, I don't like that. And last year in a sophomore campaign was much better. Uh, I, I still think my main concern with Josh Allen is he runs around a little bit recklessly at times. He runs around and I go, is that great? Like you're taking a lot of hits. It makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but man, the, the best moment of the year for Josh Allen was Thanksgiving Day in Dallas against the Dallas Cowboys. He shredded them. He was phenomenal. Made great decisions. He looked really good. And man, I am just so happy for Buffalo. I, I'm just happy I was wrong. They found their franchise quarterback. Josh Allen's awesome. The team is really good. The team in Buffalo, I mean, the the moves they've made last offseason, then again, this offseason are really paying off. I mean, they brought in a great receiver, Stephon Diggs, from the Vikings. He's going to be a big contributor. They have really good talent on their offense and on their defense. Uh, the Patriots lost to Tom Brady, so the AFC East is wide open. And, uh, you know, the Bills, they're a great team. They are the team now to beat in the AFC East. They are the favorite to win the division next year. And uh, they're making a move to try to win a Super Bowl. I'm just well done by the Buffalo Bills. They've made tremendous progress. And their young quarterback, Josh Allen, has made the biggest leap forward. And he's the big reason. Like, I, I look, go watch my old video. Again, it's called The Bills Will Go 6-10 and 10 in 2019. I said they brought in good talent. They brought in good starters. I knew the team was going to be good in Buffalo last year. But the thing I just could not quite predict was just how much better Josh Allen was going to get. He made a tremendous stride forward, and uh, he's the reason why the Bills did so well and made the playoffs last year. And I'm just so, so happy for the Buffalo Bills. Now, the Jets. I predicted the New York Jets to go 7-9 and nine last year, and they did, in fact, go 7-9. and nine. But th- the trajectory of their season did not go exactly like I believed it would. Not the way I expected. Their quarterback, Sam Darnold, actually began the year. Right after week one, he got mono. Ugh. It caused him to miss a month of football. And with that, the Jets went 0-3. Now, the Jets were lucky. One of the weeks where Sam Darnold was sick and missed football because of mono, it was during their bye week. So he only missed three games instead of what it probably would have been four. But it's interesting, you know, without Sam Darnold, they went 0-3. With Sam Darnold as their starting quarterback, they went 7-6. And, six. and he, you know, he missed three games against the Browns, the Patriots, and the Eagles. And I just got to wonder, if Sam Darnold had not gotten sick, the Jets might have gone 9-7. and seven. Maybe they would have gone 8-8. Eight and eight. And really, the story of the Jets' season last year is, if only this hadn't happened, it might have been better, right? If, you know, they their linebacker Avery Williamson tore his ACL in the preseason, that really cost him, didn't play the whole year. Uh, Their gigantic free agent signing, C.J. Mosley, another linebacker, had a groin injury. He only played two games last year. The Jets were plagued with injuries. And as a franchise right now, the Jets are really, really fascinating. They have this head coach, Adam Gase, who looks like a complete buffoon a lot of the time. People in New York hate him. He's just got moments where you're like, what are you doing, man? I don't know about this. But Sam Darnold, the young quarterback, is great. He's been... The, like, you you know the the image of a lighthouse? It's always in the horizon. It's steady. It's just, I can't think of a, what's another example? Like, Sam Darnold is the steady thing in that franchise. He's been great. He really got a lot better last year. He played so well, despite the fact that the weapons around him weren't fantastic. If the Jets can get a few more pieces around Sam Darnold, I think he's the right guy. Now, the question is, is Adam Gase the right coach? I have no idea. But with a couple key players returning next year for the Jets, From injury, uh, the Jets could be all right. They have a great running back, Le'Veon Bell, T.J. Mosley, Avery Williams is coming back. They have pieces in New York, and they can keep building around Sam Darnold, try to get him a receiver, something like that, uh, and and keep building that offensive line. The Jets are headed in the right direction if the coach is right. If the coach is wrong, they're screwed. But really right now, Sam Darnold kind of reminds me a lot of Carson Palmer. There's a lot of stuff going on around him, but he is the steady thing in their franchise. Carson Palmer played for years with the Cincinnati Bengals, and they were a mess all around him. But he was the steady thing. He was always prepared, always ready to go, and he really elevated them. And it's so funny. I mean, Sam and Carson both won the Heisman Trophy. <laughs> Did No. 
did Sam, I don't think Sam Darnold won the Heisman Trophy. I apologize for that. I'm stupid. I remember he was in the front running. Sam Darnold was a quarterback out of USC, a top pick. Carson Palmer was a top pick out of USC. And in fact, man, um, Sam Darnold, I know I'm going to get shredded for that misspeak that he won the Heisman Trophy. But I, I still say, like, the, the comparison right now between Sam Darnold and Carson Palmer is just really, really, I think, range true. He's a great quarterback, elevating the people around him. The question is, can the franchise, the New York Jets, get their their act together good enough to support their young quarterback who's budding and playing really well? If they can, I mean, Sam Darnold's on a rookie contract. I am so excited because he's he's tremendously good. He's better than what they're paying him. And if they can support him with great talent, he it's the kind of thing where, remember when the, the Philadelphia Eagles made a run at the Super Bowl? They had Carson Palmer, or Carson, excuse me, Carson Wentz. Their quarterback, Carson Wentz, was on a rookie contract, which is really cheap. If the Jets can do what the Eagles did with Carson Wentz, which is build a really expensive, great team around a cheap quarterback that's really talented, the Jets could make a run at the Super Bowl. The question is, is the coach right? And can the Jets put good enough pieces around Sam Darnold? I believe in Sam Darnold. The Jets would have had a better year if he hadn't gotten hurt. And again, the whole story of the season for the Jets last year was, if only blank hadn't happened, they would have been better. The Jets went 7-9. and nine. They could have been a lot better, and I hopefully they will be in the future. We'll just see, man. There's a lot of things up in the air for the Jets right now, but they do, in fact, have the right quarterback. Sam Darnold is a lot better, way better than people are giving him credit for being. Now the Miami Dolphins. This is the one that, oh, it excites me. I predicted the Miami Dolphins to go 5-11 and last year. And hey, lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. They did go 5-11. The reality of my prediction was, oh, the Dolphins went 5-11. and Now, last year was a rebuilding year for the Dolphins. They had a new head coach, Brian Flores. He was in his first year of a five-year contract. And the Dolphins were not very talented last year. They started the season 0-7. Here's how the first four games went. They lost their first four games. They lost 59-10. to They lost, uh, That was to the Ravens. They lost... 43 to 0 to the Patriots. They lost 31 to 10 after that. They lost 30 to 10 the week after that in week 4. But after their bad 0 and 7 start, the final 9 games of the year, the Dolphins finished 5 and 4. And the Dolphins made tremendous progress. At the end of the year over the course of the season, man, it's rare that a team goes 5 and 11 and you feel really really good about it. I mean, I am telling you the Dolphins, as a team, made tremendous progress. They were not a 5-11 and team. They were not talented enough to go 5-11, and and they did. I mean, they really overachieved. They did a lot with their roster. And you have to give a ton of credit to the Dolphins' new head coach, Brian Flores, man. He did a great thing. He really built and elevated the culture of the Miami Dolphins. And it's just coaching, man. Like, if you help players and develop their skill and develop young guys, you'll see what happened to the Dolphins last year where... Their young, untalented guys developed and got better. But at the end of the year, they were a strong, cohesive unit. And that's a massive, massive deal. That's why the Dolphins got so much better at the end. Now, the only thing I, I really, I like the wrinkle I couldn't quite get right with the Dolphins last year that I couldn't have predicted was that the Dolphins ended up rallying around their veteran quarterback, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Like, who would have thought, you know, uh, what do they call him, uh, Money Money Matt? Fitz Magic is what they call him. <laughs> it's it's just cool, man. Like they ride around this old, old veteran quarterback, and he was the right guy. And it's very interesting to me, especially at the beginning of last year. Many people were accusing the Miami Dolphins of tanking. And it's just not true. Like the Dolphins were trying to win games. That's why they played Ryan Fitzpatrick. He was the best quarterback they had on their roster, and they played him because the truth is if you play a quarterback who's not the best on your roster, you lose the locker room. You can trade away players, but that's the only way you can tank. The only way you can tank in the NFL that works is if you trade away all your talented players to get assets and get draft picks. But every Sunday you have to be trying to win or else you lose the locker room and you lose respect for the head coach. So what the Dolphins did, I believe the Dolphins found a way to somewhat tank. You know, they traded away their assets. They traded away their best players. They traded away Kenyon Drake. They traded away Laramie Tunzel. They traded away Minka Fitzpatrick. And they got draft picks for all of those guys. But once the team was finalized, the Dolphins were trying to win every single Sunday. They were building a good culture. They were doing player development. And that's exactly what happened. 
You know, the highlight of the year for the Miami Dolphins last year was they beat the New England Patriots Week 17 in New England, in Foxborough, Massachusetts. And the Patriots were trying to win. The Patriots losing cost the Patriots a first-round bye in the playoffs. And the Dolphins beat them outright. And it's really cool to literally measure the progress the Dolphins made over the course of the year. Week two, the Dolphins lost to the Patriots 43-0. to zero. And then at the end of the year, week 17, this is how much better they got. The Patriots lost to the Dolphins. The Dolphins went into New England and beat them 24-27, to 27-24. to 24. I mean, to lose that badly to a team at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, come around and beat that team in a really meaningful game, the Dolphins made so much progress last year over the course of the season. And I got to say, man, their head coach, Brian Flores, looks like an awesome guy. He's building a culture I'm a fan of, and I am so excited for the football future in Miami, man. I just I can't wait to see the Dolphins continue to grow. I think they're doing the right stuff. I hope they get a franchise quarterback in the NFL draft coming up. Uh, but the Dolphins are building a great culture and one that I, I'm really a fan of and one that I find myself rooting for because I like Brian Flores, and I'm so impressed with the way he rallied that football team at the end of the year and developed players and made them better over the course of the season. Like, as a football nerd, I just look at that and go, well done, man. That's a great coach. You did a great job. And uh, never met him. Don't know much about him as a person. But as the product you put out on the field every weekend, it's clear he's doing the right stuff. And I'm rooting for Brian Flores. Like, that's just an awesome, well-done job. So it's kind of funny, man. It's weird and wild how accurate I was with the AFC East. I predicted the Patriots to go 12-4. and four. That's exactly what happened. I predicted the Jets to go 7-9. and nine. Bam. That's exactly what happened. And I predicted the Dolphins to go 5-11. and 11, And that's exactly what happened. The only spot I was wrong in the AFC East is I predicted the Bills to go 6-10. and 10. They ended up going 10-6 and six instead. Um, but I, I work really hard to prepare for my NFL predictions podcasts. I do way more work than probably other people do. I literally run through the NFL schedule, pick every single game, do it three times to make sure I have all the same numbers and verify and cross-check them and stuff. And, um, you know, things always change. Like, there are things that happen that you can't predict, like Andrew Luck retiring. But, man, I worked hard and I nailed the AFC East. I feel really good about it. I'm pretty proud of that. And it was really, really fun to do my predictions. So, guys, I'm going to take a short break. When I return, we'll do Ask Zach. We will answer questions from the audience. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. I'll be right back. All right, we are back. Uh, it's time for Ask Zach. This is the part of the show where I answer questions from the audience. The way you submit a question is you go to patreon.com forward slash Zach Schaumler. You give a dollar a month. You can give more if you want. Please do. It literally helps pay my rent every month. And uh, if you submit a question, I do not guarantee to read your question on the show. I don't want people to you know come on to Patreon and be disappointed. I want to make the expectation clear. What I do guarantee is that I read every single question that is submitted on Patreon with my eyeballs. I look at every single question with my eyeballs. I pick the top couple to read on the show. I haven't done an episode in a while, so we have a massive amount of questions built up and a lot of stuff ready to go. I'm really excited. Let's jump in. The first question today is from W. Austin. He writes in and says, Zach, who are you the most excited to see get drafted on draft day? And what team could you see make the most moves? Um, man, the guy I'm most excited to get watch get drafted is Jordan Love, the quarterback out of Utah State. I'm just so curious where he goes. I don't know, man. He's such a talented quarterback, but he needs coaching. And I just, I personally can't wait to see how the NFL views Jordan Love. Where do they put him? I put him as... I think even maybe a better quarterback in the long run than Justin Herbert. But does he end up, does the NFL view him as a top 10 pick? Is he a first round quarterback? You know, I think he's a top 10 quarterback talent wise, but he needs coaching. His decision making needs work. He reminds me a lot of Patrick Mahomes when Patrick Mahomes was in the NFL draft coming out of Texas Tech, where, man, he's incredibly talented. He's a just a, got an arm like crazy, but. Uh, and a, more than Josh Allen, Josh Allen was a great, had a great arm, but P- Jordan Love has his ability to run around and escape and make plays on the run and doing stuff with his legs that 
really reminds me a lot of Patrick Mahomes. And so I'm just curious to see where does he go and how does the NFL view him? Does he go to the Patriots? Do the Saints move up and draft him? Could he end up even going before Justin Herbert? I don't know. I- I'm really excited. Is he a top 10 pick? Well, a team that doesn't need a quarterback immediately. Again, a team like the Patriots who has a quarterback. Excuse me, what am I saying? They, they don't have a quarterback. Uh, a team like the New Orleans Saints who has a quarterback. Who, and I'm going to have the use of that. It's weird to think of the Patriots without Tom Brady. That's insane to me. Uh, but a team like the New Orleans Saints who has a quarterback but also needs to build towards the future or the Green Bay Packers or a team that has a guy but also eventually is going to need to replace that guy, could they move up and get Jordan Love? Uh, to me, I think Jordan Love might be the most interesting story in the NFL draft because he's the guy who I'm like, I think he's really talented. I don't think he's ready to play week one, but he's so talented and he's so good and has so much potential I think a team is going to move up and grab him, very similar to the way the Chiefs moved up and grabbed Patrick Mahomes. And so Jordan Love is a guy I'm most excited to watch get drafted. Now, what team is going to make a lot of moves? I think the team that I can't wait to watch is the Miami Dolphins. They have three first-round draft picks. Three. That's unheard of. And so they're going to have a lot happening and a lot going on. And do they trade up? Do they trade some picks to go get a quarterback? Maybe they, there's rumors they might trade with the Cincinnati Bengals. I don't know how that would happen, but maybe that happens. But either way, man, I'm, I, the the guy I'm most excited to watch get drafted is Jordan Love, the quarterback out of Utah State. And then the team I'm excited to watch make a bunch of moves on draft day, whether they trade up or whether they end up just picking the first, the, all three picks in the first round. What do the Dolphins do? That's what I want to watch and what I'm excited to see. Now, the next question is from Zach. Zach writes in. He says, hey, Zach, I appreciate you giving me something to listen to. During this TV remote period, remember I called the the outbreak uh, that's keeping us all in our house, I called it TV remote because I literally on the fly couldn't think of anything else to remember it called by. Zach says, I got to ask you, if you could choose to play for or coach for any NFL team, which team would you choose and why? So for me, um, you know, I would most want to be employed by the Carolina Panthers. Uh, you know, Charlotte seems like a great area, sure. But number one, the most important thing to me is that their owner, David Tepper, is a guy that I love. I really like the direction he's headed in. I like the decision decisions he's making. I like the people he's hired. I like his, he seems like he has a really good core ethos and value system. And I honestly, I love the coach they have, Matt Rule in Carolina. If I was a player, if I was, a, if I'm coaching under a head coach, man, I'd love to work for Matt Rule. I mean, everything going on, And the Panthers building right now really, really speaks to me. Um, I just love the direction the Carolina Panthers are headed. And I'd want to be in that building growing something with them. You know, Miami's a close second to me. Uh, I think the Dolphins are in a similar place where they're building something, and that sounds fun. But, you know, if I'm building something, first of all, if I'm in the NFL, especially if I'm a lower, let's imagine my, what would my role in the NFL actually be currently today? I'd be some kind of scout. Honestly, I'd work in analysis. I'd do something where I am helping a team decide player personnel and who to bring into their roster. Um, or I'd be coaching quarterbacks, something like that. I'm not going to be an NFL coach. Like, I'm just, if we're actually thinking realistically, like, what could I do in the NFL right today? I could do player personnel. I could do scouting. And I could work with quarterbacks and think really, really well. And so um, if I was going to step into a role like that, a team I'd want to work for is the Carolina Panthers. I love the quarterbacks they have in the room. Um, I like everybody in that building, and I would want to build something, but I'd only want to build something if I could work for and work with people that I believe in, and I really strongly believe in everybody in the building for the Carolina Panthers, the owner, the offensive coordinator, uh, the head coach, everybody there, Joe Brady, the offensive coordinator, Matt Rule, the head coach, David Tepper, the owner, everything the Carolina Panthers are doing is just something that really speaks to me, so if I was going to be employed by any NFL team, the team I would most want to be employed by is the Carolina Panthers. So Ben writes in. Ben says, hey, Zach, I've heard it talked about in the media world, but do you think that there's a possibility the NFL season will be delayed? I sure hope not, but I'd understand if they needed to. Thanks for reading this with your eyeballs. Hope you're safe. Uh, will the NFL season get delayed? I don't think so, actually. I actually do not believe it will. Um, This is very complicated. But most likely the answer at this point is that 
the NFL, my prediction is that they're going to be playing football games in empty stadiums without any fans. That's really what I believe will happen. Uh, there's going to be regular testing. NFL players, I think, are going to get isolated from society a little bit. Uh, but they're going to keep everything insular. They might have players all live in a hotel room. The NBA's pushed back on this. The players in the NFL want money more. They're willing to play in empty stadiums. They're willing to even be away from their families. If it means they get paid and get to send fam- money to their families. And, um, you know, I really believe that the NFL season is going to happen. The NFL has much more control over their players. And, you know, they, they view players like assets. The NFL has way more control over what happens to their players than other football leagues like college football. I mean, college football has a really difficult barrier because they need college campuses to be open in order to have a season. And it's not going to be easy. But the NFL will quarantine. And, I mean, that means everybody. Literally, like, ball boys, towel guys, uh, the people doing laundry. If you touch anything in an NFL facility, you got to be part of the quarantine process. It maybe mean you're not a party with your family. I don't know what's going to happen. But I do believe that the NFL is going to make their season happen on schedule. They're going to have regular testing. They're going to play in empty stadiums. People are only going to watch on TV, which really, to me, like that's a great way to watch NFL football. And, man, I, I think, honestly, people need the emotional pick-me-up. People want the NFL season back. The economy needs the help. Emotionally, people need something to watch and something to keep them going a little bit. That's not a great reason right there. Like, But I think that the NFL, if they can make it happen, are going to make it happen because they will dominate ratings. It'll be the only thing on TV that's really interesting that is new and fresh. They're going to kill it, and they want to come back, and I think they're going to do everything they can to make it so they hit the deadline, even if it means playing in empty stadiums, which, again— isn't great, but playing in empty stadiums, getting a ton of television viewership, it's not the worst thing in the world. So Jacob writes in. Jacob writes in. He says, hey, Zach, love the show. What do you think of this year's offensive rookie class? This year seemed amazing compared – this year before comp- seemed amazing compared to this one. He talks about how you know two years ago you had Saquon Barkley, Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, Quinton Nelson, Cortland Sutton, Nick Chubb. Uh, a whole slew of guys. He said, but I don't think this year was the same. He says, Kyler Murray seemed fine. Daniel Jones and Gardner Minshew were fine. Josh Jacobs wasn't bad. Devin Singletary and David Montgomery were, G- Montgomery were underwhelming. Uh, the, the long story short of Jacob's question is, this is, look, the NFL offensive class, rookie class last year in 2019 was just not that impressive. Um, and he says, you know, I'm probably wrong, but it seemed like there were much better offense rookies Two years ago than last year, what do you think? So, Jacob, um, clearly you've never heard of Terry McLaurin. And I don't blame you. uh, But Terry McLaurin is a receiver for the Washington Redskins. And him and Kyler Murray might be the two best offensive players from the 2019 NFL draft class. They are phenomenal. Go you you know Kyler Murray, one offensive rookie of the year. He gets a ton of praise. He's awesome. But go watch Terry McLaurin film. Go watch him on tape. The dude, he's a huge. Just even if you want to go look at his highlights, that's good enough. Like you might not have access to film. Go on YouTube. Go watch his highlights. Terry McLaurin. I should do a film analysis of the guy. Honestly, I mean he is a stud. He's got so many tools. He can burn you deep. He runs really good routes, smart routes. I think, which is I really like that about him. Uh, I'll explain what that means if I ever do a film analysis video. He can grab jump balls. He's got great body control. Terry McLaurin, the receiver for the Washington Redskins, is super underrated. I mean, that dude is the best. Maybe uh, like Kyler Murray is the best offensive player because he's a quarterback. He's more valuable. Terry McLaurin is just next level good. I mean, he is. I did a you know my Tom Brady film analysis video. I talked about all the top outside wide receivers. I really should have put him in there. He's a great. He can do it all, man. He's he's a really fantastic receiver. And because he was on a bad team last year, went totally under the radar. So pay attention to Tara McLaurin, the quarterback out of Washington. He's a great one. He's a special one. And I think he's going to be in the league for a long, long time. Okay, two questions. I'm going to kind of shove them together. First, Jake writes in. He says, where, in your opinion, is Cam Newton going to land? And do you think with this new fire lit under him, he will return to form? Shout out to you from everything. Uh, shout out to you from down here in South Carolina. Hope everything is well. That's Jake's question. We'll just move on to Andy's because we'll come back to Jake. 
And he writes in and says, where is Jameis Winston going to play next year? So Cam Newton and Jameis Winston are a huge mystery to me. I don't know. You know, my fear is actually that neither one of them is going to find a team. Um, you know, there's that <laughs> Jake You know, says, do you think the new fire lit in Cam Newton's belly is going to help him return to form? Um, you can be very motivated, but if you're injured, it doesn't matter. Is Cam Newton actually healthy? That's a real question. Now, people go, Cam Newton fans go, well, he's healthy. He passed a physical. Ah, he passed a physical. Clearly, that means he's healthy. Um, yeah, he passed a physical that was conducted by the Carolina Panthers and his agency. <laughs> he's going to pass the physical. Like, it's a, it's a very biased interest that conducted the physical that he, quote, passed. And so, is he actually healthy? Like, straight up, no, no one really knows. And the problem that he's running into right now is that uh, COVID-19 is making it really hard for NFL teams to bring Cam Newton into their facility and to meet their doctors so they can do medical evaluation on him. No one really knows how good or how healthy Cam Newton is. So uh, it's just the problem is getting worse because he can't even go meet with teams because of COVID-19. Now, Jameis and Cam have a really big problem. Both Jameis Winston and Cam Newton want to be paid like NFL starting quarterbacks. And the problem is that the NFL ownership, general managers, coaches, the NFL as a whole doesn't really view them, either of them, as starting quarterbacks. No one likes saying that. No Fans of either quarterback do not like hearing that. Let me tell you, Cam Newton fans are going to write all kinds of horrible stuff to me in the comments. But I, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm, I'm just saying what is factual here. Uh, people wonder, like, is Jameis or Cam a headache, or are they helpful? Straight up, people wonder, can Jameis Winston handle a back? Well, can Cam Newton handle being a backup quarterback? Would their egos get in the way? That's the uncomfortable reality of how the NFL views Jameis Winston and Cam Newton. Like, can they sit behind another quarterback? Can they handle that? Are they going to cause problems in the locker room? Their futures are so, so fascinating to me. Cam Newton's future. Jameis Winston's future. I'm not sure when or if a team is going to sign them, but here's the really important part of this. whole. If you take nothing away from this story other than this one part, this is the part you need to hear. Jameis and Cam will not be given the benefit of the doubt. They will need to do what Ryan Tannehill did. They have to join the team as a backup quarterback. And then they have to wait until they get an opportunity and take advantage of it. Jameis and Cam need to do what Ryan Tannehill did, which is go to a team with an established quarterback and win the job. That's the really important thing here. They both need to sign cheaper, team-friendly contracts worth less money than they think they're valued because they're not viewed as starting quarterbacks. They got to remove their ego a little bit. If they want if they truly want to play, they can play, but they got to sign a contract for less money, and they have to be willing to be backups, at least at the very beginning of the year, and do what Ryan Tannehill did, which is go into a team and over time earn the job. But they got to go the Ryan Tannehill route and earn their way back to become starting quarterbacks. Jameis and Cam are not going to get handed starting quarterback jobs week one on any NFL team. That, that's just a reality. Fans might be furious. They're going to say, well, Cam did this and Jameis did this. And the NFL doesn't care. That's how the NFL views them as. The NFL views them as backups until they prove otherwise. And so um, they're not going to go anywhere and be a starter week one. And it's on them to prove how good they are. They got to take less money. They got to earn the right. And they have to, over time, earn a starting job. And if they're not willing to do that, Jameis and Cam are not going to play again in the NFL unless they put their egos aside, take less money, and go the Ryan Tannehill route. Remember, remember, by the way, in case anyone doesn't understand what I mean, when I say the Ryan Tannehill route, Ryan Tannehill was the Dolphins' starting quarterback. The Dolphins traded him away. They got rid of him. They moved on. They said, we're not going to work with Ryan Tannehill as our starting quarterback anymore. Ryan Tannehill went to the Tennessee Titans, which already had a quarterback, Marcus Mariota. When Marcus Mariota wasn't good enough, they benched him. They put in Ryan Tannehill. Ryan Tannehill became the franchise quarterback. He led them to the playoffs. He won a, got a gigantic four-year contract with a ton of money. Ryan Tannehill earned his spot 
He was willing to be a backup first and wait till he got an opportunity and take advantage of it. That's what I mean. When I say Jameis and Cam need to take the Ryan Tannehill route, that's exactly what I mean they need to do. They need to take a back seat. They need to be willing to be backups, take less money, and earn a starting job. Sign a one-year contract if that's what it takes. Jameis, sign a one-year contract, prove how good you are, prove how valuable you are. Bam, sign a big contract. But you're not going to get one right now until you prove your worth and play better on the field. Alone writes in, he says, Zach, who is your favorite player in this new draft class? Does not have to be based off of skill. My number one favorite player in the 2020 NFL draft class is Jalen Hurts. I adore, I love Jalen Hurts. I'm such a huge fan of him and his maturity. Uh, I do not know that Jalen Hurts is going to succeed at an NFL level as a quarterback. I don't know, but I hope he does. I really do. I'm concerned about his his accuracy, his decision-making, his arm strength, yada, yada. His mechanics are interesting to me. But Jalen Hurts is one of my favorite all-time starting quarterbacks. Jalen Hurts is phenomenal. His story, his maturity, the way he handled himself in college, transferring from Alabama to go to Oklahoma, the way he played at Oklahoma, literally his leadership at Oklahoma was so cool. Uh, Jalen Hurts is one of my favorite players all time in college football. He's great, and I'm rooting for him. I was really sad he didn't win the Heisman. Number two, my second favorite player in the NFL draft is Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is one of my favorites because I greatly respect and admire Joe's work ethic. The improvements he made as a quarterback make him easy to root for because he was a guy with you know, average arm strength, not a great quarterback, not really highly thought of as an NFL quarterback, who in one season got so much better, he became probably the number one overall pick in the NFL draft. His decision-making, his accuracy, his footwork, it all demands a ton of respect because he's clearly put in so much work. That work ethic really reminds me of Tom Brady. It's the attention to detail. It's a guy who is not the physically the most gifted quarterback, Joe Burrow, who came in, did everything possible he could to get better, controlled everything he could control. And as a result, Joe, Bur- Joe Burrow is probably going to be the number one pick in the NFL draft. Joe Burrow reminds me so much of Tom Brady. It's crazy. And uh, he's my second favorite player after Jalen Hurts in the NFL draft. Zechariah writes in. He says, hey, Zach, who are some of your favorite players currently or from the past 10 years that tend to go under the radar and don't get that much attention. I got two that come to mind. I want to start with Philip Rivers. Philip Rivers uh, really has been underappreciated what he's done in the NFL. He's played for 16 years in the NFL. Every single year so far with the Chargers, he'll play next year with the Colts. And uh, Philip Rivers has never missed an NFL start in his entire career. He's played 16 games every single season, all 16 games since 2006. For the Chargers franchise. That's insane. He's put up huge numbers. He's got a ton of comebacks. He's been a great leader. The face of the franchise for 16 years. And yet nobody respects him. For whatever reason. Nobody seems to respect Phillip Rivers. Because not for whatever reason. For the reason that he hasn't won a Super Bowl. No one appreciates him. And no one really seems to recognize. Oh uh, Phillip Rivers played for the Chargers. A really historically not a great franchise. It's had a ton of turbulence and weird ownership. So I think Philip Rivers, number one, needs to be high, you know, more appreciated. Number two is Tony Romo. Both Tony Romo and Philip Rivers are two great quarterbacks that I think are vastly underrated. It's sad to me. You know, it's Philip Rivers, Tony Romo, and Carson Palmer are three quarterbacks that look, Philip Rivers is the only guy left who might win a Super Bowl. I hope he does with the Colts. But to hate a quarterback or not believe a quarterback's great because he never won a Super Bowl. It's silly. Like, there's so many other factors. Carson Palmer was a victim for years of the Cincinnati Bengals. Of course he didn't win a Super Bowl in Cincinnati. I hope Phillip Rivers wins a Super Bowl with the Colts. I, that would make me so happy. Um, but to me, Rivers, Colt, and Tony Romo, and uh, Carson Palmer are three quarterbacks that have been really, really underrated in the last 10 years and haven't gotten the love and respect that they deserved. Okay, Patrick writes in. Patrick says, Hi, Zach. During the offseason, you see mock drafts everywhere in the media. Do you think that they are just filler content, or do you see value in them? And could you imagine doing a mock draft yourself on SOS? Let me know. Greetings, Patrick. 
Um, oh man, I I could see myself doing a mock draft. I struggle with the integrity of mock drafts. There are two big reasons that I think are very very problematic with mock drafts. There's two things. There's two big factors with them. Number one, there's what would I do? What would I, Zach Schaumler? If me, Zach Schaumler, was drafting you know, players in the NFL draft, what would I do? And then there's the other aspect of a mock draft, which is what do I think other NFL teams will do? There's a, a human element. Humans are very silly, silly creatures. Um, they don't always make great decisions. A human, again, makes silly decisions that aren't predictable. I can analyze all I want. I can say... This guy's number one. This guy's number two. This is the best. Here's what I think. Here's what my opinion is. Here's what I see on film. But the question is, do the Cincinnati Bengals agree with me? Do the Dolphins? Do the Redskins? You know, plus, how can I predict what trades are going to take place? You know, I could do my own modified version of, the, of a, a mock draft. But you can't predict. The Dolphins have three first-round draft picks. Are they going to move up in the draft? Are they going to make a trade? Is anybody going to make, make a trade? You can't predict that. So there's that weird point where, you know, predicting what is going to happen is kind of a guessing game. And I might do maybe a mock draft where I go, here's what I think should happen if everything is great. I could share my opinion on the mock. If I do a mock draft, here's what I'll do. I'll say, here's what I think should happen. And then we can compare what I believe should happen versus what NFL teams end up doing. Do I think the NFL teams are doing the right thing? This, you know, I, we'll do that. That's what we'll do. Um, but at some point, I'll do a mock draft. I just struggle with mock drafts. I think a lot of them are very, they are filler content. They're very silly. And, uh, you know, the rest of this month will be basically entirely dedicated to the NFL draft. At some point, I'll do a mock draft. But I'll do it my way, a little bit unique. Probably talk mostly about quarterbacks. But I got a lot of time. I'm going to dive into what every team needs at some point. I want to do a a topic for all 32 NFL teams about what they need in the NFL draft. And that'll be really informative and help me kind of do more of mock draft stuff. Who's going to draft who? And when and why. Um, but again, it's really weird because I can share. Like if I, I can think that Jordan Love is a top 10 pick. And Jacob Eason, the quarterback at the University of Washington, should be a second round quarterback. But then some NFL team is going to draft him in the top 10. Jacob Eason, I mean. And go, we'll go like, what? But they're the crazy human beings that think that he's better than I do or whatever. Like You can't predict what other human beings are going to do. All you can do is share what you would do. And so I, I remove the prediction part and just share what I think is right and my analysis for the NFL draft. And that makes more sense to me. Okay, Seth writes in. Seth says, Good afternoon, Zach. Longtime fan and Patreon supporter. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, what NFL draft prospect do you feel will be most negatively affected by the NFL team's inability to exclusively interview or work out players in person? Tua, of course, comes to mind, but anybody else? Yeah, so Tua is huge. Tua, uh, medical evaluation has been really tough because of COVID-19. So Tua, tongue of a low, the quarterback who had a hip injury, is going to have a problem. Uh, teams are going to have to kind of go more on faith that he will be healthy and yada, yada. Um, but any player who has had off-the-field issues is in trouble as well. Uh, often NFL teams can meet with a player like that, talk to them face-to-face, -face, shake their hand, Ask them tough questions in person. They can see their face when the player responds. And you can't do that now. This NFL draft, I believe, the 2020 NFL draft, could have a higher number of busts than normal simply because NFL teams can't do their normal procedure. They don't have all the information they normally have. And NFL teams screw up anyway. NFL teams tremendously screw up the NFL draft all the time, even with a ton of information, even with a ton of stuff. NFL teams often, I heard Nick Saban talk about this one time. He said, half the NFL teams that draft my former players don't even ask me about the former player. How crazy is that? If you're going to draft a player, talk to their coach from college. Ask the college coach, hey, uh, did the guy work hard? What kind of guy is he like? What's he like in the room? The coach knows him more than anybody. I can't believe NFL teams don't do that, but a lot of NFL teams have no idea what they're doing, and they do the draft process horribly anyway. So now imagine they're doing a draft process crippled where they have even less information than they normally do. A, a lot of NFL teams, a lot of NFL teams want the draft to be postponed. But the problem is the NFL wants content. They believe the NFL draft is a television show 
teams view it as a tool. The NFL, the league views it as a as a TV show. So the league wants content. The teams want more tools to help their team win. And I, I really believe that the NFL should delay the NFL draft, but it's not going to happen. And it's going to cause a lot of problems. Teams are going to miss at a higher rate than normal. And they already miss way too much in the NFL. We have one, two, three, four, five questions left. Uh, what's happening? I'm like, I hate Google Drive always causes me problems. Um, Thomas writes in and says, Hey, Zach, been watching your videos for close to a year now. And my question is, if the Bengals draft Joe Burrow, are you worried that he's going to get sacked into oblivion with having to face dominant defensive lines within the division against the Bengals' turnstile offensive line? Could he turn into David Carr 2.0? Um, go watch Carson Palmer, A Football Life. My fear is that Joe Burrow's talent and potential will be wasted in Cincinnati. It makes me sad. I don't like saying that. But it's a sad, harsh reality behind Joe Burrow's career. And that's not an attack on Bengals fans at all. I feel bad for Bengals fans. I just believe that the Bengals' ownership has no idea what they're doing. I don't believe in the Bengals' coach. Zach Taylor is a young guy, never done a head coach before, was terrible last year. There's a reason the Bengals have the number one overall pick. I do not want Joe Burrow to go to Cincinnati. I do not want that. I like him. I'm a huge fan of Joe. And I do not believe that Cincinnati's good for Joe Burrow at all. I don't believe it's good for I don't wish that fate on anybody. Cincinnati's a horrible franchise. They're terrible. They have bad ownership. I don't want teams to, I don't want players to go there. It makes people mad. Again, no, I, I love the city of Cincinnati. Cincinnati fans are people who choose to support that ownership group. That's on them, not me. I'm not attacking Bengals fans. I'm attacking the ownership group, who I think is terrible. The Bengals owners are terrible. Don't go play for them. Joe Burrow's career and potential would be wasted in Cincinnati. It would make me very, very sad. YS writes in, he says, Will any team be willing to sign Antonio Brown after Bruce Arians' comments on why he won't bring him onto the team? If so, which teams? No, I don't think any team wants him. Uh, Bruce Arians completely shut down any chance of Antonio Brown joining the Buccaneers. He called him a diva. He said he knows him because they did work together in Pittsburgh with the Steelers. Bruce Arians said there's been way too much miscommunication with everybody. What's going on with Antonio Brown? No one can seem to figure it out. And he says that Antonio Brown is great on the field, but he's not a fit in their locker room. To me, Antonio Brown is a sad story. He's a talented player whose off-field issues have ruined his career. Nobody wants to work with him. Nobody wants to work with him. He's one of the most talented receivers in the world and on the planet. On planet Earth, Antonio Brown is one of the best NFL receivers working right now. He should be in the league. Talent-wise, he's there. He's incredibly talented. He's a top five NFL talent. He makes any team instantly better on the field. The problem is he's also a top five headache. Nobody wants to deal with him. The fact that he's still a free agent is very telling. Nobody wants to work with Antonio Brown. He's so talented and yet clearly so bad that nobody is even trying to go near him with a 10-foot pole. Even teams like the Seahawks, who historically take chances on players, are like, nah, we're good. We are totally good. And Tony Brown is sad. Uh, he's caused a lot of his own problems, and uh, his problems off the field have been, become so bad that nobody even wants to work with him. Inigo writes in and says, hey, Zach. First, I want to say I love your show. I'm a huge fan of yours. I love your content about football, and I'm learning a lot thanks to you. I am from Spain, and I was basically born into Formula One. So I was extremely excited to hear about Formula One being one of your recent passions. Dude, I love it so much. Uh, my question, is there any driver in particular that you're cheering for? Thank you for looking for at the question with your eyeballs. I live in Orlando, F Florida. So if you're ever uh, in the area, I'd love to have a beer with you over Formula One and have some conversations. Yeah, dude, that'd be great. I, I want to go to Orlando. I want to go. Where's... I believe Orlando is where Disney World is. I want to live in the South someday, so I'd love to go to Disney World. If I'm there, I need to go. Reach out to me on Patreon. Let's get a beer. Let's go to Disney World. It'll be so much fun. I have other, you know, I got a couple Patreon supporters in Orlando. Dude, there people in Orlando, Florida gets a bad rap. People in Orlando have been incredibly nice to me. So you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Inigo, 
look, I don't root for anybody very much. I don't have a favorite NFL team. Uh, for me, I love sports and I love the stories that sports give us. So I, I'll be honest, I cannot pick a favorite driver. But there are a ton of drivers that I really like. Uh, I love Daniel Ricardo. He's got a great personality, a ton of talent. I kind of feel sad. You know, Daniel Ricardo stuck driving a rental car. It's like, ugh, it's such a waste because he's a great driver, uh, but he's in a bad car. Now, Max Verstappen is possibly the most talented driver in F1. He's fun to watch. I don't know. I don't have his personality. Don't give a crap. I just, he's fun to watch drive. He's really, really good. Sebastian Vettel's really interesting. He's funny, man. I, Sebastian Vettel's interviews are just great. He's uh, won, I've been a world champion a couple times before. He was great on Top Gear. was really fascinating and interesting and fun. I like him. I, I like Sebastian Vettel. Just straight up, his personality is really interesting. Uh, I like Carlos Sainz. I like Esteban Ocon. He's really a cool story because he's a more normal dude who's got a ton of talent, who works hard. He's not from an incredibly rich, wealthy, famous family. Esteban Ocon is just a guy who works hard and races really well. Even Lewis Hamilton seems like a good dude. Lewis Hamilton has been dominating Formula 1 for years now. Um, I mean, there's just so many F1 drivers I enjoy watching. I can't pick a favorite, but there are... F1 is chock full of great stories, and that's why I love sports. So uh, I, I love the engineering aspect. I mean, the cars, I'm just in awe of. I'm so in awe and fascinated by cars in F1. And uh, I think that, you know, watching watching football in general, what am I saying? Watching F1 in general is so cool. And so I'm just fascinated by everything that goes on there. I think it's incredibly awesome. Okay, Zach writes in. Zach says, what is your favorite type of pizza? Style and topics. Okay, um, and my nose is driving me crazy. I'm going to read this question. Again. I got something oh, picking up my nose on the show. It literally hurt. I have like a zit deep on my nose. You ever had that? It's the worst feeling where you're like, you just feel all this pressure and it just hurts and it's not good. And it's like, it's kind of bleeding, but nothing's coming out. I don't know. It's not good. Um, Zach writes in. He says, what's your favorite? Well, restart for the third time. We've now complained about boogers. We've messed up the intro. Zach writes in, he says, what's your favorite type of pizza, style and topping? Uh, number one, I'll eat basically any pizza. I there's very few pizzas. I mean, you can come up with a pizza I won't like, uh, but there's m most pizzas I'm going to really eat and enjoy very much. Um, I got to say, I love pineapple on pizza. That's a very controversial thing. I'm a pineapple guy. You know, give me, you know, pineapple pepperoni is pretty much my go-to. I love it. I also love the Papa Murphy's. Uh, gourmet veggie pizza. It's got artichokes on it. There's a Papa Murphy's right on the corner from where I live. It's great. Uh, cheesy crust. You know, some places have cheese in the crust. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, there's a place in Vancouver, Washington, where I live called Blind Onion, uh, where they give you honey because the crust is so good. It's like a little, like a like a bun, and you just dip the bun in honey. The, the crust, after you eat the pizza, you dip the crust in honey and you eat the honey crust. Oh, it's amazing. Um, I love pizza in New York. New York style pizza is really cool because you grab a slice, you walk around the city. Like I had buffalo chicken ranch pizza with literal just ranch on the pizza. Oh my god, oh that's amazing. Um, yeah, New York, New York pizza special. I, you know, I get I get a bad rap. I often eat pizza. And by the way, cheese pizza is really good. The, the New York style cheese pizza just oh, it's phenomenal. Now I get made fun of a lot because I eat pizza with a fork when I watch football. But you got to realize I'm working. Like, when I'm working and taking notes, I mean, I got to have a pen, a paper, and do diligent note-taking. I can't have my hands all dirty and greasy and crumbly, so I, I, I eat pizza with a knife and a fork when I watch football. But normally, like, I, I'm not a person that can eat pizza with my hands. I just, if I'm working and don't want to get my hands dirty because I'm writing literally notes with my hands, I, I use a fork and a knife because that's easier for me. Uh, deep dish pizza's phenomenal. And, uh... I just can't do anchovies. I've never been interested in anchovies. It terrifies me. It freaks me out. Not good to me. And so that's what uh, that's what's on my mind recently. The last question is from Sam. Sam says, hi, Zach. Fan from Birmingham, England here. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, as we are stuck inside due to being in lockdown at the moment, I have a question for you. You got any shows being sport or not that are worth binge watching? Keep up the good work, dude. Uh, I got a couple shows. I, I made a cool list from this. Uh, number one, Ozark on Netflix. Oh, it's phenomenal. Uh, I'm about to start. Their season three just came out. Uh, my girlfriend and I watch it. We're going to start season three very soon. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Rick and Morty on Hulu. 
Rick and Morty. What a show. I mean, I, there are very few shows that just suck me in. Rick and Morty? I love it. I just, I really, um, it's like, you know, a lot of shows are heavy. Ozark is dark. It's good, but it's dark. It's heavy. Uh, many shows I watch and like, it just, they make me tired because I'm like, ugh. Watching people die, real world stuff, it's hard. Rick and Morty is just fun. It's always fun. It's never tiring. It's just like a hug. I mean, it's just like the perfect popcorn fun show. Uh, Stargate, if you ever watch the Stargate movie, then watch the Stargate television show. It's phenomenal. Very similar to Rick and Morty. It's just not animated, but it's got great characters. It's fun. Uh, Dirty Money, there's a Netflix series on Netflix. Uh, that's a Netflix documentary series. It's all about criminals and like how they make their money and how it's oh, it's phenomenal. Um, all or Nothing is a docuseries on Amazon Prime. You can watch football seasons and uh, get in de- behind how a team is doing and how their season went. Uh, Modern Love on Amazon Prime. I'm a sap. I love, like, About Time is a great romance movie. I like romantic stuff. And so Modern Love is a, that's a, a television series. That it's got, it's a short, it's got like eight episodes. It made me cry multiple times. It's phenomenal. If you like, if you're even remotely interested in romance at all, it, like, if you're a person out there that wants to find love and you're single and alone, watch Modern Love. Oh my gosh, it's phenomenal. Uh, they're all great shows. Now, the last show I want to recommend is Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's probably my number one favorite show of all time. I love Larry David. I have never connected more with a character than Larry David. He's socially awkward. He gets himself in trouble all the time. His predicaments are hilarious. It's so great. I love the show. I love him so much. And, um, oh, by the way, I forgot about this. There's a show called Strong Opinion Sports. If you're, if you're looking for anything to do, there's this great little sports show by a guy who wears silly shirts all the time. You should watch his show. Um, he gives really great, informative takes on sports. Uh, he's really honest. He tries to be himself, and uh, he does the best he can. So, I mean, if you want a great show, I recommend Strong Opinion Sports probably is, is my, if I mean, that's what I would watch if I was you. <laughs> uh, guys, that's all I have, man. Thank you so much for tuning in. I want to end the show this way. The way I end every single podcast. Um, four years ago. Crazy, it's been that long. Four years ago. A little over four years ago now. Uh, my younger brother took his life. He committed suicide. And it's terrible. And so, like, especially at a time like now where everyone's stuck inside. I think people are going to become alcoholics at a higher rate than normal. Breakups are going to happen like crazy. People are going to be more depressed than normal. Uh, if you're struggling, go get help. Do not suffer in silence. If you have anybody you can reach out to, go get help. Uh, call somebody uh, and, and make sure the people in your life know how much you love them. If you have nobody to talk to at all, you can call the Suicide Hotline, 1-800-273-8255. The Suicide Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. Only call them if you really have no one else to talk to. But if you have no one, call the Suicide Hotline. Uh, but make sure the people in your life know how much you love them. My brother and I hung out all the time. We played Halo. We played video games and sports and uh, we played high school football together. We worked together. All our conversations revolved around four things. Video games, girls, movies, and sports. And that's it. And I regret not having more in-depth conversation with my brother about other stuff. And so I encourage you, make sure you talk to people in your life. If you're having a hard time, tell them, hey, if you need someone to talk to, you can always talk to me. Reach out to them. Make sure that you, they know they're loved. And tell the people in your life you love them. Give them hugs. Make sure they know. Hey, man, I care about you. I love you. I'm here for you if you ever need it. Um, If you're struggling, go get help. Please, especially everyone's depressed right now. If you're struggling, do not suffer in silence. My brother never told anybody he was having a hard time. Came home. He was dead on the floor. It's miserable. Nobody wants that. I please am begging you. If you're struggling, go get help. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so very much for tuning in. I really, really appreciate it. My name is Zach Schaumler. Uh, That's all I have. But I'm bum. Bam, we are done.